breaking news, though, coming in, uh, some developments on what we know about the a shooter in the attempted assassination of Donald Trump. Our chief law enforcement and intelligence analyst, John Miller, joins me now. And, John, uh, you have a lot of new information here about the shooter. Aaron, there's been some developments as the investigation has progressed. You know, what the, what the investigators are telling us is, as far as a motive, a manifesto, um, the reasoning behind this, the suspect is still a blank slate. But what they have developed is a lot of the background about what happened that day. They know that he went to his employer at the nursing home where he works as a dietary specialist before this and said, I need Saturday off. I have something important to do. Um, but he told his co-workers, I'll see you on Sunday. So he changed his days off, presumably for this. We also understand that when he got to the fairgrounds where this rally was being held for Donald Trump, the first thing that puts him on the radar of security people is, Near the magnetometer area where they're screening people in, he's carrying in his hand a rangefinder. It's a device that looks like a small pair of binoculars, but it's used by shooters to measure the distance when they're setting up a long-distance shot. Uh, because he didn't have a weapon, that would not have prevented him to go, to go through security. Uh, but they did flag, what does he have this in his hand for? Um, at that point, they told people, keep an eye on this guy. But then he leaves the secure area, the staging area, and he doesn't turn up again for some time until uh, the crowd says there's a guy crawling up the roof and it appears he has a rifle. There is an eerie moment in here, Aaron, where he's mm -hmm. taking the rangefinder and he's looking through it at the counter sniper positions. And one of the counter sniper positions is looking at him through the scope. At this point, there's not a gun in the picture, as I understand it, but they're saying he's looking at us, looking at him. Then when people alert the police wow. and they try to come up the ladder to get him and he confronts them with the AR-15 gun, um, they dive for cover. And then a moment later, he opens fire. But a lot of this sounds very spread out. The end of it happens very quickly. The last piece is the search of the car. Um, as we reported last night, two remote-controlled um, IEDs, uh, remote-controlled bombs in the car, the remote control for those devices found on his person on the roof, um, according to yeah. sources, uh, three fully loaded magazines with nearly 100 rounds, a bulletproof vest. So it raises the question, did he expect to escape from this? And if so, what was all that intended for? What was to happen next? Um, questions that are still open in the minds of these investigators. Right. I mean, I know that they, they say they just simply don't have details on motive. I mean, I just, just saying as a layperson, I understand, you know, if you don't have a gun, then you can go through. Having a range finder and still being allowed to go through, I think is jarring for many people watching that, that they would have some discretion to say, sorry, you can't bring that in there. Um, well, so I, so I will admit just, yeah. That's a go really ahead. interesting point because... This is a, a prickly issue, which is, you know, this is uh, in, a, in a place where there are a lot of Trump supporters. There are a lot of Trump supporters coming to the rallies. Um, you may have been to these rallies where people show up wearing camouflage. People show up outside the rally with weapons. Um, this is not a weapon. It's a device used by shooters, but also by golfers to measure these distances. And for security people, the Secret Service uh, Uniform Division to make a decision about you can't come in um, could actually backfire on, on, on the rally organizers and so on. So which yeah. So can I ask you one other thing, John? I think that's and it's important the context that you just gave about who would be there, the message you'd be sending to others. But then th th this question that he goes through the screening and he has the range finder, but obviously he ends up with the gun which he uses on top of the roof. So when does he get the gun and where? So when he leaves that secure area um, and appears to depart, he goes outside the inner perimeter, outside the outer perimeter to that third layer, um, which is that, you know, uh, that football field and a half away. I mean, the working theory is he goes to the car, he retrieves the weapon. Um, I don't know how he carries it or conceals it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then moves towards that building, yeah. and there's a so long wait. Can I time. just? I'm sorry to interrupt, John. I'm trying to understand, and maybe sure. it is unclear at this time. But if you clear security and the metal detectors, you can get back all the way to your car to get something and not go back through the 
metal detectors? So to be clear, when he was in a secure area with the rangefinder, there was nothing that would have stopped him from clearing security. He leaves that area, mm -hmm. then he goes to get his weapon, presumably, but then he doesn't go back into the secure area. He's way outside the, the mm. perimeter where they're doing security screening. In fact, the people who spot him are among the people who couldn't get into the rally or didn't go through security who are outside the wall where it's happening and looking in the direction because you can't see it from there, but you can hear it. You can see it if you're on the roof. Right. All right. And, and, and I mean, just crucial and incredible details here, uh, especially bringing that that, uh, you know, scope in through security. John Miller, thank you so much. Breaking all of those new details for us.